Thank you very much for joining us this evening. My name is Christine Schaka. I'm the curator of European Art 300 to 1400 CE at the Walters Art Museum. That means I'm in charge of the medieval objects here at the Walters. Before we get started, I'd like to read, take a moment to read the Walters Land Acknowledgement. The Walters Art Museum acknowledges the Piscataway and Susquehannock nations that originally inhabited the land on which the museum is located. We also acknowledge tribal nations, most notably the Lumbee, who migrated here, and indigenous peoples whose ancestors are represented in the objects we steward in our collection. So I'd love to welcome you this evening to an installment of the Walter series of object focus programs, where we do a deep dive on a single artwork from multiple perspectives. Tonight, we are focusing on the Ben Ezra door. And I wanted to um, get started tonight by giving you just a little bit of background on this particular object and then pass it off to our two speakers this evening, Amnea Abdel Barr and William Rhodes. I'm really pleased this evening to be speaking to you about this really special piece in our collection. Um, this piece is jointly owned by the Walters Art Museum and the Yeshiva University Museum in New York. This door was originally one of a pair belonging to a Torah ark or the container used to hold a sacred Jewish text in a synagogue. And in this particular case, it comes from the Ben Ezra synagogue in Old Cairo. This synagogue was destroyed and rebuilt many times over the centuries. And whether it was damaged due to natural disasters or religious persecution, the Jewish community in Cairo continued to revive it and restore it. And so what I show on the screen here is an image of the front and the back of this door. And it originally, like I said, would have been part of a pair. So if you can kind of extrapolate out and imagine that. The art door is made of walnut wood and it has been carbon dated to the 11th century. But the carving itself that you see on that door is stylistically really related to the arts of Mamluk Egypt. And that's the period from about 1250 to 1517, which suggests that it was perhaps damaged and needed to be recarved in this later period. Specifically, if you look on the left at the lobe medallion at the, and at the center, filled with leafy tendrils, um, resembling uh, Islamic book bindings from the 15th century. And you have another roundel on the right-hand side. And I know one of our speakers will go into a little bit more detail about these motifs. There are traces of painting and gilding that date to the 19th century on this door, which relates to an even later period of rebuilding and restoration. The Ben Ezra Synagogue is associated with a famous medieval thinker, Moses Maimonides, who lived from 1135 to 1204. He was among the Jews and Muslims persecuted in and exiled from Spain, eventually winding up um, in Egypt. So after traveling across the Mediterranean, he took up residence in Cairo, where he became a leader of the Jewish community there. The synagogue is also the site of the great 19th century discovery of the Cairo Geniza, so-called Cairo Geniza, which is a treasure trove of documents on medieval Jewish life around the Mediterranean. Most recently, the Ben Ezra Synagogue underwent renovations that were completed in this year, 2022, and we'll come back to that a little bit. Now, this door, if you're familiar with it or if you've seen it in our galleries, um, it used to live on in our third floor Center Street galleries, our medieval galleries, right at the very center among actually Eastern Orthodox Christian objects. And um, it's moved just through a threshold to um, the adjacent space that used to house our Islamic art with some reinstallations that we've been doing lately. So our Islamic art is moving to the fourth floor of our center street space, and that will open in April of 2023 in just a few months. And in the Islamic art space, we have introduced a new installation of medieval Mediterranean art. And this was a collaboration between myself and our Wheeler Mellon postdoctoral fellow in Islamic art, Ashley Dimmig. Um, Ashley and I really um, worked together quite well and we really wanted to keep the connection that existed before between medieval European art and Islamic art on that third floor of the Center Street building. So we proposed to make a dedicated gallery to art coming from the medieval Mediterranean. So art coming from the Jewish, Christian and Muslim faiths 
um, talking about things like pilgrimage, um, artistic exchange, motifs that you find in these artworks to kind of show the interconnectedness of this region um, and these cultures that existed side by side and um, coexisted and also um, enacted exchange between their various cultures. I should also note that the co-owner of this piece, Yeshiva University Museum, will mount an exhibition in May of 2023 focused on the figure of Maimonides, who I mentioned. And the door will be a central piece in the exhibition. So I hope that you can see the art door in that context next year in New York, or also in the new medieval Mediterranean gallery before then. So without further ado, I wanted to introduce um, our two speakers briefly, and then we'll go into um, a little discussion from each one of them. Our first guest tonight is Amnea Abdelbar, who's an architect with experience in urban conservation, monument restoration, and cultural heritage documentation and digitization. Her work is focused on Mamluk art and architecture in Egypt. She holds a PhD in history from Ex Marseille University, 2015, a master in science in conservation from Raymond Lemaire Center in Coul in 2004, and a bachelor's of science in architecture from the fine arts of Helwan University in 2000. She's currently the Barakat Trust Fellow at the Victoria and Albert Museum in New York. I'm sorry, London, that's in London. <laughs> I do know that. Wonderful museum, great medieval collection. She's working on the KAC Creswell's photographic collections in collaboration with the American University in Cairo, the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford and Harvard University. Since 2012, she's been documenting the looting and destruction in historic Cairo and has actively campaigned to save Cairo's architectural and cultural heritage. So welcome, Amnea. See you. We're many time zones away from the Walters right now. And no, also, this is fascinating, huh? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> She's coming to us from very close to the homeland of these, of these doors. Um, secondly, I would like to welcome William Rhodes. William Rhodes was born right here in Baltimore, Maryland, and attended the Baltimore School for the Arts, which I can practically see from my office here. He later received a BA in Furniture Building and Design from the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth, and he moved to San Francisco in 2008. Rhodes' creative works are in the collections of various galleries and museums, and most recently his work was included in the collection of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. He dedicates part of his time to art education, including art collaborations with schools and senior centers in San Francisco, South Africa, Italy, and wait for it, also Egypt. Currently, he is the Intergenerational Art Director at Bayview Senior Services. So welcome to you, William. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Okay, so without further ado, I will pass the, the mic over to Omnea. Thank you, Christina. And again, it, it's just fascinating because I'm in very, very far away in a different continent, not even in Egypt today, but uh, speaking about a piece that comes from my hometown or my home city, so it's it's very exciting. I really want to thank the team for inviting me to speak about the Beni Ezra door. First of all, because I didn't know about it, and what a shame, you see. Um, I was in Cairo last week. I tried to visit the, the, the synagogue, but it's still closed. It should be open uh, shortly because they're uh, wrapping up uh, the, the renovation. But I visited ages ago, and uh, it's exciting to see that such a wonderful element that used to exist in it eight, probably from the 19th century is being given so much attention in Baltimore so I'm, I'm really uh, I'm, I'm really touched so I, because this is really the work of museums and curators and bringing such focus to the collection so thank you and thanks to the team behind making this as well Octavio and Paloma so let's go to my uh, first slide um, because the, the synagogue is closed, I uh, relied on my friends and um, it's not easy to photograph uh, the synagogue, to be honest, because sometimes you're, you're not even allowed to photograph it. The synagogue is not functioning and it's being used as, um, you know, like a, like a monument to be uh, visited. Um, but it exists in a very, very particular space in, uh, in, in Cairo 
which is Fustat. And Fustat is actually the very first Islamic capital in Egypt. Um, it's also in an area that we call the Old Cairo. So the medieval city is called Historic Cairo. And further south is this area of Old Cairo where we have the earliest uh, <clears throat> churches and this beautiful synagogue. And Christina already has told us um, the history of it. And it has been destroyed several times. And the building existing today is standing from the 1890s. So let's go to my next slide. When, um, when I first saw the, the, the door that uh, the team has sent me, um, the very, very first thing that struck me is that it reminded me, it reminded me of the design composition of carpets. You see, like something that you see every see very easily and every single day, perhaps, but then you never link it because it's a, it becomes more or less of a universal design. And so I picked for you this fabulous carpet. It's a huge carpet that we have at the VNA. Um, do Google it and read about it. It's the Erdabil carpet, and it's made in the, in the 16th, uh, 16th century. And just because I like design and, and, and geometry and composition, it clicked with me immediately with this very classical carpet design that you can find. If you even Google Persian carpets, you would find it. And this made me think, so actually that this composition, when did it first uh, land in, um, in history? I don't have an answer to this question yet, but I would like to show you as well what this door reminded me of. Um, next slide. Um, Christina already told us that it that it was uh, they tested it, <clears throat> and it's probably the wood dates from the 11th century. But there's also the possibility that maybe the carving dates later on because it's very very much Mamluk to me. I picked this painting that was found it in um, the mausoleum of Shagar ad dur And Shagar ad dur is the first sultana of the Mamluks. She was uh, married to the last Ayyubid sultan. And in 1250, she became a sultana for, I think, 80 days until uh, she married another Mamluk and he took over the, the reign. But Shagar ad dur was a fabulous woman in history because not only through her, the architect, the, the, the rule uh, shifted from the Ayyubid to uh, the Mamluks, but also she created a new typology in architecture by um, introducing the dome in the religious foundation. We didn't have a dome before, uh, only minarets. Domes were always linked to mausoleums. And a friend of mine, Mail Ibrashi, restored her mausoleum in, I think, the past five years, and it was actually funded by um, a US aid fund. And she found this uh, medallion painted on one of the walls. So we are here in 1250, and you look at this design composition and immediately it speaks to you with what we see on the door. Next. But then this form of medallion with these elongated uh, floral composition, you find them very much in every single Mamluk uh, monument and religious foundation. I picked this one. I probably picked you my favorite, uh, my favorite examples because there's so many. But this one is also gypsum. So the first one is a painting. This is done in gypsum, and this is in a beautiful, beautiful um, Mamluk mosque built in the mid, in the early uh, 14th century, recently restored um, by also a dear friend of mine. It's a bit different, but then again, if you look closely, you will see that we have. Uh, a bit of similarities with <coughs> the composition of the floral decoration in the medallion. Next. <coughs> um, I'm, I'm trying to show you that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't just um, uh, something made for one specific medium or one specific material, but that the Mamluk makers were enjoying discovering how they can carve or paint or um, or even sometimes inlay these forms on, on different materials. Here we find a marble, which was taken out from a mosque from the same period from the 14th century, but it was actually a reused uh, a marble panel, which was taken from a house dating a century before at least. Uh, but in here, it's very interesting because you start seeing the composition in the corners, um, and it, it's, I don't know if it's uh, clear enough to see, 
but if you uh, focus a little bit, uh, look at the corners of the rectangle, and you will start seeing that exact same carving that we have on the Bani Izra door. Um, if you get a chance to uh, see this uh, marble panel, which exists at the Museum of Islamic Art in Cairo, it's beautiful because the floral becomes uh, really exciting. It In the middle, they feel like they have done them as if they were hands, uh, holding each other, and there are like very funny va variations in, in the decoration. Um, so you feel like the maker becomes more uh, comfortable and maybe uh, tries to develop uh, the, the design further. Next. And then we, we have the doors. These are very classical, iconic uh, bronze decoration put on wood. And the Mamluks will excel in it. One very important thing is, in Egypt, we don't have enough wood. We don't have good quality wood. Wood is always imported. So even in the Mamluk period, they would import it from Syria and also from Europe. And so they made this trick of, instead of having a beautiful uh, mahogany or ebony um, uh, doors, because they couldn't afford uh, having them in Egypt, they would cover just normal wooden um, doors that the, the, the type of wood which we call Aziz in Egypt that you can find and then they would cover them entirely um, with a, a bronze decoration. We have several beautiful ones that if, even if you google bronze doors in Cairo you will find magnificent uh, examples. But in every almost every uh, funerary foundation and religious foundations. I'm saying funerary because they always used to uh, attach their mausoleums. That, that was Shagrat Dur influence from the beginning. Uh, so that's why they became these funerary religious foundations. But then you always have in the courtyard the four schools of uh, uh, Islamic, the Islamic schools, because these foundations were also uh, places for education. And with each of these schools, you would find the door leading to the quarters of the school. And this one I picked for you because it's in one of the most beautiful, beautiful, um, it's called Khanka because you would have also Sufi living in it. but And it's a madrasa because you would have students studying in it. And at the end, it's also a mosque. And you see how they have elaborately done the decoration of the medallion. It becomes extremely sophisticated. They added door knockers, but we still have this composition of the inscriptions on top and on the bottom, which we are finding in the Bani Izra door. And that made me think actually of maybe, maybe the carving dates to a later stage. Maybe uh, the wood existed from uh, the 11th century and perhaps the carving came over afterwards because it is very much speaking to me when you see such doors. And I've also picked you um, one of the paintings done in the 19th century because just to give you a sense of uh, feeling how the spaces were and how the doors were in the architecture context. Next. Um, just... In that same building, in the Khanka of Sultan Zahir Barkouk, there is this door, which I actually didn't know while I was doing the research for this, um, this talk. I was speaking to a friend of mine, and then he told me, wait a second, I think I know there's a carved door in that same foundation. And he sent me this photograph, Abdul Rahman. And, uh, and actually, because I think this would be one of the rare examples of carved wooden doors from this period. Um, again, it's... It's the style is a little bit different, but the design composition is the same. We have the inscription band on the top, and then we have the medallion in the middle, and we have the four corners on the sides. <clears throat> Next. Yes, and just to show you that they have played with, with the designs as we go further uh, in uh, the Mamluk period, <clears throat> it becomes elaborate. They play with the geometry. Here, we don't have a floral decoration, but we have a geometric composition. And actually, this specific mosque in Darb al-Ahmar, where I, my foundation is based actually in, in Cairo, is the top of the top, really, when it comes to Islamic geometry. I would really invite you to even Google Mimbar Qajmas al-Ishaqi, because I think it's one of the most sophisticated um, uh, geometric composition I have ever seen. And to end with the, the history of the doors, let's go to our next one. Um, 
I'm showing you the one of Qaid Bey. It's just, it, we are at the end of the Mamluk period, but they have kept true to this design. And I really, I am quite surprised that they, it become like something iconic and something very classical in Mamluk architecture, which you find really uh, uh, everywhere in in um, in, uh, in in the foundation they have created. But not just on doors, like Christina was telling us on manuscripts, and that's I think my coming slide. Let's see. Yeah. So we have a, with the book binding, and. Uh, and then with manuscripts, I, I will end here, uh, <clears throat> Paloma, the following one. <coughs> yes. This is a book written in the same period of the Sultan Qaid Bey, which had the last door I was showing you. But you see, it's it becomes like one of the most important design elements that we find in the Mamluk period. And I, I, I knew about them, but I really never noticed that that close and I think I would be very curious to try to keep on doing the research and try to understand why this particular form but the interesting thing here when you look at it is that I've shown you an example from a Muslim or an Islamic foundations and the maker who made these doors for the Bani Ezra synagogue also made them in the same spirit and this gives you this idea of this beautiful diversity as well, and this beautiful, beautiful multi um, faith that existed in Cairo during the Mamluk period. Of course, there were hiccups. History tells us, but in general, and even when you study um, uh, uh, the, the sites and how the sites were built, you find all sort of uh, makers and, and and craftsmen from different faith. Because also, you had many, many, many uh, uh, migrants who came to Cairo because it was <clears throat> very much, um, uh, um, um, how do you say, supported with the patrons and there were projects everywhere and there was money. So that's why it was a time where, where art flourished um, uh, uh, tremendously. Um, the last thing I would like to tell you before I leave you with William is that when you think about it, why do we have such a piece at the museum? And why was it taken out from the synagogue in the first place? And I have to tell you this, that the, the field of restoration and the field of cultural heritage and even museum, it's very new. Uh, at the VNA, the VNA was created in 1851, the British Museum and it's at the end of the, uh, of the 18th century. In Egypt, our first museums were in the beginning of the 20th century. And I haven't really checked that much with uh, the, the story of museums in the US. But you see, it's a, we're working with very old objects, but we are ourselves a very new discipline. And what used to happen, not just in synagogue, but also in mosques and in, in churches in Egypt, at least in the 19th century, is that people still had the skills and the know-how of the time. So it's fine. If this door is damaged, let's just remove it and make another one. It was just easy. And actually, at the very beginning of in, in 1881 in Egypt, we had something called the Comité for the Conservation of Arab Art. And one of their... Um, uh, very prominent figures, uh, uh, Semei Kabesha, he used to go to churches and actually buy the object because he he was afraid that even the, the silver uh, basins would be melted and uh, maybe the doors also would be sold. It was this notion of protection of preservation that we are very, very keen about today, which, that, which was not at all in place. And finding such objects in the collection in, in the US makes us actually think how uh, people co started collecting these artifacts in the 19th century, and they have actually given them another life in the 20, 20th and the 21st century. So that in itself is a very, very exciting thing. I'm telling you this because I'm someone who works a lot on looting, and I try to stop sales with for illegal stuff. But it becomes then, I always try to explain to my friends in Egypt that not everything Egyptian that you find in museums abroad are stolen because many of these things have been actually bought on the markets in Cairo. Um, I will end here. I think I even uh, took a little bit more of my time. Uh, and I want to thank you for listening and I uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you.
I think you didn't hear any of that. I was muted. <laughs> Let's try that again. Thank you so much, Amnea, for your incredible insights. I was really convinced by um, your tracking of that motif from the Ben Ezra door throughout various media and Islamic art. I thought that was really compelling. Um, and I have I have so many more thoughts and questions, so we'll save that to the end. Um, right now, I'd love to pass the mic over to uh, William Rhodes and um, for him to give us a little perspective from his um, standpoint as an artist and a woodworker. Hi, again, I would like to uh, thank everyone and thank you for having me. This definitely taps into two of my passions, one being working with wood and also my passion for uh, collecting and also trying to create reliquaries or ways to preserve sacred objects. So really as a woodworker, as a carver, um, I'd like to really focus on the spiritual aspects of that and also the, the properties of working with wood. And um, with this image that you see in front of you, um, I, with a lot of my pieces, I work with uh, religious symbols, uh, work with, with a lot of uh, various things, uh, historic images throughout history. And I often like to focus on working with wood because number one, wood is a living object, which we all know. What that basically means is, you know, obviously it comes from trees, but also wood has a... Uh, an aspect where it continues to show you that it's alive throughout the whole course of its, it, its existence. For example, um, if any of you have ever heard of something called expansion and contraction, that is a basic process where during certain seasons or certain periods of time with climate changes, or say for example, in the winter or in the fall, wood has a tendency to contract, which means it kind of closes in, maybe at very small degrees, depending on the wood. And then if you're in a climate or in a, a location where it's like summertime or spring, it has a tendency to expand more, which basically means more moisture actually gets into the wood and it actually expands. So it's constantly letting you know that it's alive. Now, as a woodworker, these are things that you often have to think about because when you're producing something, you have to think about if I'm making something and I have it in a certain location, is it going to change? Are the doors, are the top, if I'm making a tabletop, is it going to expand and contract and affect that piece of furniture that I'm making? And these are, so uh, with my own personal uh, projects, I like to actually start off where I actually draw out the thing that I'm working on, and then I cut it out with a, um, a handheld jigsaw. And then I go back to some traditional, old traditional ways of working. For example, um, using carving tools, just like the tools that were used with carving the Ben Ezra door. Um, the tools may be different during that time, maybe slightly different, but if you can see on your right-hand side, that there are basic metal carving tools and there's a wooden mallet that I use to actually go in and carve out the details. Right next to those actual carving tools, you will see a, um, a tool that I call a right angle grinder. That tool is a, has a wheel on it. And basically you can take that wheel and you can use different types of sandpaper on that to actually shape and help form the piece into you know whatever uh, shape or whatever design you'd like to. If you wanna start off really rough, you can actually buy wheels that have little cutting blades around it. They're basically like li little mini chainsaw blades and you put it on that right angle grinder and you can actually carve out huge chunks out of a piece of wood to really get a a really uh, rough design and then go back in, use your hand tools and other things to get it more refined and then get into sanding to make it uh, more of a polished piece. So um, when, when I think about the Ben Ezra door and I think about the fact that the wood that was used was a walnut. 
for me, that's a really special wood. Walnut is a really, really special wood. Um, it's important because walnut is, is a hard wood. It's a wood that is something that has a very beautiful grain. It also has properties where it can be finished in such a way where it has a really, really beautiful chocolate finish. Excuse me for one second. I have to make sure my computer is, is clear. I'm so sorry. My, my power was actually going out. But walnut is, is, a, is a really special wood. So I'm not really sure of the complete history of the Ben Ezra doors, but I wonder for producing something like that for the um, for the Torah, for these sacred Jewish Jewish texts, was it important to actually bring in a walnut or have a special walnut panel to really be used to cover or house these sacred texts? From some of my research, I've actually uh, read a, a little bit on some of the woods that were really popular um, in Egypt and in that region during that time. And walnut was, I don't think, a very popular wood at that time. So I'm not certain. It may have come in from another location. Um, some of the fig woods were very popular, I think, during that, during that time. Date, palm woods, um, even willow was another popular wood. Those woods tend to be a little bit softer. Walnut tends to be a more solid, durable door, uh, durable wood, and it would be excellent for producing uh, a door or a cabinet door. Could we go to the next image? So um, through my travels, um, I'm, my, a lot of my work and a lot of the things that I do are basically inspired based on my travels. And um, some of the locations I've traveled, I've traveled directly into Egypt. I've traveled into certain regions into West and East Africa as well. And specifically in certain areas of West and East Africa, when you are entering into a sacred space, particularly coming into a place, um, into a, a special person's home, if you're entering into um, a, a, a space or a place that's considered a sacred ground, the doorways are really, really important, very important. And entering into those, some places, particularly when I was in West Africa, really focused on having a system set up, a kind of spiritual system where if you entered into those spaces, they could tell if you had the right spirit for being in those spaces. There were bottles that were actually placed into some of these doorways, into these entrances, and they would ask you to pass through. And then I guess they would get a feeling or would detect certain things, your intentions, your feelings. Um, and I just found that very fascinating. So this is just an image of me uh, in East Africa outside of, of, of a structure, of a person's structure. Uh, on the right, there's an image of um, some blue, beautiful blue doors. If you've traveled through certain parts of, of Egypt, particularly in Aswan or certain regions um, along the Nile, the villages there, you'll see these beautiful blue doors that are painted. Um, and it's a lot of detail. It could be a very simple house, but it's really important to deal with the entrance, you coming into that space really making that look a certain way and ha and really giving off a certain message and a certain energy entering and and leaving those spaces uh could we go to the next image so these are images of um boxes that are made of uh grass and it has objects that i've actually sewn into it these are objects that come from my family. Why I wanted to show these objects is because these objects, these boxes are actually housing, for me, very spiritual objects, very similar to the importance of housing um, a spiritual text. So these boxes are housing Bibles, my family Bibles. Um, it has my family history in it. it. 
these Bibles are from the uh, 1700s and it goes back, it documents um, members of my family. And so having these things, there's a certain amount of energy. There's a certain amount of weight that you, that they carry when you have them and just having them just sit in a simple open space. It, it really calls for much more than that. So I had to really try to figure out ways to create things that can house that. And I wanted to show you this because when I think about the Ben Ezra doors and I think about the people that actually, the craftsmen that made those doors, I can only imagine how important it was to really think about the object that you are, you're producing something that is going to be a protection or a way of locking or keeping this sacred object safe to really make sure it is going to be preserved and it's going to last. And also the thought of this is the text that I'm that I am trying to protect is going to be something that is not only something that comes through the word of God, if you believe, but it also is something that this, these words and these these texts are going to be things that will be passed down to different generations. So you have to really think about what can I produce to house something that has all of that weight connected to it. So this is just an example. Um, and I'm going to use my work as an example because I, I work firsthand, again, with things that I consider sacred objects and really finding ways to create doors, cabinets, or vessels to really house those things. Um, can we go to the next image? So this is an example of uh, the Bible, my family Bible. This is just one section of it. Um, they're, they're, the oldest entry is from 1808. Um, and um, in comparison to the Ben Ezra door, this is a very young object. But for me, it's very important. As you can see how fragile it is, um, just like, you know, text could be, um, it's important to really think about how are you going to house and protect that? Because as you can see with this image of this Bible, you know, it's gone through a lot. It has a lot of wear, it has a lot of uh, aging in it. So you just can't leave it out to just bare elements. So really thinking of how can I house something and protect this thing? And going back to the Ben Ezra doors, walnut is an excellent choice because it is a hardwood. And it is, a, it, it is a, a, a wood that would be a beautiful way to protect it, to keep it safe uh, during different changes or whatever that could happen. Could we go to the next image? These are other examples. So um, there are smaller sacred objects that I have. They're sacred family objects, things that have been passed down. And I, um, they're very, some of them are glass objects and other uh, smaller things from my family. So I actually took uh, a series of bottles. These are regular um, whiskey bottles or just regular bottles that you would have. And I actually use them to house these sacred objects. Um, I went in, I did gold leaf, I did painting. And I added certain elements to tie into um, religious icons that relate to my family and my family history. And so these are these have become uh, more than just a bottle or more than just a piece of art. They are actually things that are designed to house sacred objects. And you can see they can open and close so they can act as a cabinet or a door. Very similar uh, process. Can we go to the next image? As far as larger scale objects uh, and pieces, so this is a large cabinet, which I made. Um, it is over seven feet tall, very large. Uh, again, designed for housing uh, sacred objects. This is um, majority carved wood. It is walnut. So as you can see, uh, walnut is a very popular wood. You can see the richness and color. And this is uh, American walnut. So you can see the richness and color. The finish that I used on it was a linseed oil combination. Um, 
It was a linseed oil that I put over a period of time with walnut um, as far as finishes go. If you use oils, linseed oils, or even sprayed lacquers, it really enhances the grain. So not only do you get this really rich, chocolatey, sometimes caramelly brown color, but you also can really see just the beautiful grain. And what I mean by grain, you can see the pattern, the design in the wood starts to really come out. In this large piece, I actually went in and added pigment in certain places. Um, so you could see the greens. I actually added gold leaf. And there are, these are what you would call drawers in certain places and cabinets that open. So this is, uh, again, a way of housing these sacred objects. Uh, and this was, again, hand done. It was the whole process I carved. Uh, it took me many, many months to complete this piece. And it was also created in sections. Um, one thing to keep in mind when I say it was created in sections, the drawers of this piece, and unfortunately, I don't have an image of it actually opening up, but the drawers of this image, the bottoms of the drawers, I actually used a modern technique and used a modern wood, which is called plywood. Um, the facing, and all of the, 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 basically the carving and everything that you see is solid wood. And then on the insides, there's actually plywood in different places. Why I use plywood in certain places? Because with plywood, I don't have to worry about that thing that I mentioned earlier, which is called expansion and contraction. Plywood, you can really get away with a lot of stuff with that. So in other words, with this piece, if, if it, all of a sudden starts to get a lot of moisture, um, a lot of humidity in the air. I don't have to worry about the drawer sticking or having problems with opening and closing that drawer because of the modern use of plywood. But if it was, if I was pre producing a piece during the time when the Ben Ezra doors were produced, I would have to come up with other ways of doing that, which would be creating cabinets or doors and creating in ways of moving the grain around or creating it in sections so that it would not allow it to be stuck if there's any climate changes or anything, you know, really changes with the environment. Um, next, I think I just have another image I'd like to show you. Oh, two more images. This is another larger piece. This piece is another very, very large piece, uh, life-size carved figures. Um, the figures are actually on hinges. They actually close up like an accordion and, fo and fold inside of the body of the blue figure. So um, you can call it, I guess, doors or some type of accordion type uh, cabinet, but it's the same principle. And I don't know if you can see in the details, but um, there is actually copper work that I actually did on the inside. Again, I wanted to, to really put as much detail and really focus as much as I can on producing something that was a beautiful object that was about preserving a sacred object within it and how important that is to really, really show that and have as much protection around it, but at the same time, letting the viewer know this is something special that's inside of this piece. It's not just a simple box, but it's beyond that. It goes deeper than that. Uh, and this also was carved wood. This was made out of uh, solid wood. Everything was carved. I actually chose to um, use dyes and also paints to actually create the colors. So the blue is a dye that I actually dyed the um, actual wood. And I used for that, I used a maple, uh, which is a popular wood in the States. And it's really good for painting, dyeing, et cetera. And then the smaller pieces, the, the smaller figures, they are, comp some of them are, are maple and other pieces are poplar. Those are lesser expensive woods, uh, easy to carve, easy to work with. Can I go to the next image, please? And I'd like to end with this piece. 
this is another figurative cabinet um, designed to house sacred objects. Um, and again, it was important to really create something that really, really has a feel. When the viewer looks at this piece, they understand that it is meant to really have something special inside of it. Now, when this piece is closed, uh, people just see it as a sculptural cabinet. And I'm only imagining with all of the beautiful carving, intricate work that went into the Ben Ezra doors, you know, if a person, when they first saw those beautiful cabinets, were they just completely focused on just the craftsmanship and just how beautiful everything was on the outside? And did it, did it then become secondary to understand that there was something even greater behind that? So with this piece, it's, it's that same process, um, really creating some excitement on the outside and really, but, but still having this secret, this, this sacred object hidden on the inside. This piece, like some of my other pieces, also have secret compartments inside of them. So this not only has a door which closes or a cabinet front that would close, but some of the heads are actually drawers that actually pull open too with like little compartments inside of it. So it's a whole secret world inside of it and, and these little secret things that can house sacred objects throughout the piece. This is carved wood, again, and I use pigment throughout the piece. So it's, it's paint, it's a mixture of paint and then other elements like the faces. I actually just took the natural wood, added some pigment to it, but let the natural wood grain actually come through on its own. So I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, William. I'm I'm really grateful for you sharing your work and your family history with us. I have so many questions, and I can think of so many connections to the Walters collection. Um, but I wanted to say before I dive into a couple questions of my own that um, you can type us questions um, in the chat, and um, I will be monitoring that. I'll read out the questions to our speakers as they come in. Um, so please, if you have um, any thoughts, comments, questions, um, please do uh, type them up. Um, so, uh, my first question, I have one question for each of you. Um, uh, Omnea, I wanted to start with you and to get back to this idea of what is happening in present day Cairo with the, with the synagogue. And we talked a little bit about the, um, current restoration of the, um, of the synagogue and then it's about to sort of reopen. Um, can you talk about the significance of this site for um, present day Egyptians and also specifically for um, the Jewish community in Cairo? Well, very good question, Christina. Thank you for this. Because as everybody knows, we had a tough history starting 56, especially 48. And then by the 60s, most of the Jews of Egypt have left. Um, and this left the community in a very struggling position because who would take care of all this Jewish heritage? There is an amazing lady who's the head of the Jewish community in Egypt, uh, Magda Harun. I think there's six ladies left uh, from the Jewish community. Uh, but Magda is Egyptian and that she is always saying that they never left. Her father insisted to stay. And she's the one who is holding all the keys and trying um, very, very hard to safeguard this heritage. And we all have to thank her, I have to say, because she reminded us that this is part of our own heritage as Egyptian. Um, we tend to forget that Jew, Jews, because we grew up without them in, in um, um, I was born in the 70s, uh, but, uh, but my mother went to school with uh, Jewish uh, students. And uh, the fact that we don't have them now doesn't mean that we should not take care of our uh, uh, Jewish heritage. Uh, another very important synagogue was um, restored in Alexandria by the Ministry of Antiquities, I think with a bit of help from other funds. But I'm very, very happy that this has also become um, something championed by the Egyptian state um, and allowing projects, the, the cemeteries in Basatine, which is probably the oldest Jewish cemeteries, uh, have also been recently um, uh, uh, maintained and taken care of. Um, so 
it gives us hope, don't you think? I'm, I'm very grateful and I'm definitely going to visit the synagogue as soon as it it opened up. Um, and we have, we have others, we have in Heliopolis, we have in Abbasia, in def, different uh, neighborhoods of Cairo, you, you have a synagogue more or less. That's yeah. fantastic. Thank you for those insights. You're, you're on the ground and reporting back to us for what, what's going on in the present day. That's fantastic. Um, William, I wanted to um, ask you a little bit to talk about um, sort of the significance of the door again. You said you alluded to it and you talked about it and you showed it to us in your work. I'm sort of thinking of um, the significance of the door in a, in a Christian context, but also in East Africa. So the doors being um, this kind of um, barrier between um, in, in Ethiopia, which is an area that I work on, sort of this um, doors leading to the muktas or the sanctuary of the church, which only the clerics can enter and, and not um, not the sort of everyday faithful. And um, those doors that allow access to the Makdas are often decorated in very um, beautiful ways. And so um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that significance of the door um, in a sacred context and also um, in the context of artwork that is sometimes in a sacred space. Yeah. So for, for me specifically, and, and from my experience, um, the door entering the doors in certain places particularly like i said in um i spent time spent quite a few uh a year in senegal and experienced going into certain places where the the poles and the Fulanis, there were certain groups that if you entered into their sacred into a sacred home or into a sacred space that they had bottles or certain things in those doorways and they could tell I guess your energy or give the thumbs up that it was okay to enter into those spaces. And we're talking semi-nomadic groups of people that I spent more time. Um, and I was just fascinated with that. And, you know, being an American, taking it for granted, you just enter into someone's space and there's sometimes no thought, no process, but there is a process in that. And it, and it makes a lot of sense because you're it's opening up that door you're opening up a part of yourself and i guess a part of your soul and making yourself very vulnerable so wanting the right person the right energy to come into that space uh is important so and that was based on my experience i am no expert in that area so please uh, don't uh, don't quote me on that but but as far as those experiences i've noticed that and then traveling different locations around the world just seeing the details that are put on doorways um, and just how important that is, you know, and, and we all know the, uh, I guess, popular thing is painting certain icons over your doorways to protect you from the evil eye or things like that. That all goes back to that period of time. And even in the South, there's this whole thing of painting your doors a certain color or using certain reflective qualities uh, in the Deep South, they used to use um, foil, aluminum foil, uh, over the windows. And people would often think, well, wait a minute, that's just, uh, they're poor, maybe that's just a decorative thing or whatever. No, there was a belief that the spirits or the negative energies would see their own reflections, get scared and run away. So that, using that technique for that doorway was protecting you because that was your first line of defense you have to protect that first line of defense. I hope I answered your question. You did, yeah. And it, it made me think sort of bringing it back to the Jewish context, thinking about the mezuzah being um, sort of nailed to the door frame in a, in a church, in a, Jewish, sorry, in a Jewish household, the same sort of thing, this, this idea of thresholds being a place that you want to sort of um, both bless and and sort of um, keep out what is evil, um, you know, outside and, and, and have the, you know, preserve the, the home inside. Um, and I, it makes me also think, um, because um, mezuzahs are filled with, a, with an inscription on a scroll, and I was thinking, um, Amnea, when you were talking about the um, inscriptions, it was one of the last pieces you showed, and of course, we didn't talk much about the inscription on the Ben Ezra door, but um, I wanted to read to you all what, what it does say, and we have this on our website, so please, um, if you can't make it to the Walters or to Yeshiva University, please um, visit our website, and you can read a lot more about the uh, Torah Ark door. Um, it's actually got inscriptions in Hebrew, biblical inscriptions. So on one side, it says, open to me the gates of righteousness. This comes from Psalm 118. 
Um, and then below, um, it says, this is the gate of the Lord. So that's also Psalm 118. Other side says, the Lord bless thee and keep thee, book of Numbers. And then below, the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee. Um, and we've sort of labeled them side A and side B. So I read you side A first and side B. So I do wonder sort of which side would have faced out and which side would have faced in. Um, I'm no expert on this, but, um, and I was just struck by, you know, like I said, it was sort of the maybe third to last example you showed, Omnea, where you have the very same uh, composition of the, with the central um, decorative feature, and then these two inscriptions in Arabic on top and bottom. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk any more about that, but I just, I found it fascinating. Usually what you would find in these inscription would be the date of construction and the name of the founder. Uh, so it would be an amazing uh, identification of the door later on. Um, sometimes that you would find Quranic script on the one on the top, but the bottom usually you have the, the name of the founder uh, or the person who commissioned it. Did we lose Christina? <laughs> we may have. <laughs> we said we will find. We were we were a bit worried about having some technical difficulties. Yes, <laughs> yes. I mean, oh, I say. my internet cut out. <laughs> yes. Sorry, inscriptions with you. I'll go on, go on. I'll catch up. So I, I was just saying that usually the bottom inscription band would hold the date of commissioning and the name of the person who commissioned it. Um, this is very interesting because we have one of the doors in one mosque and the Sultan took it from another mosque. The Sultan has, it was done for Sultan Hassan, Mu'ayyid Sheikh, so names, put it on his, uh, like a few years after, put it on his, and he didn't change the name. And I think this was somehow, you know, when you buy something very prestigious and you put it in your house, mm -hmm. I think for him, it was like, see, I have a beautiful, because it's fabulous, it's an iconic door in Egypt, beautiful bronze. And he left the name of this uh, of previous sultan, even though it's on his own mosque. Um, so, so such important, such texts are really important for us to identify um, date to date, uh, to, to link it to uh, its place of origin. Yeah, that's incredible. I, um, I, I mean, this is provenance in action, right? I mean, we often in the museum world, we collect pieces and we we trace the provenance of where they came from. And, you know, to be honest, things on the art market that belong to a famous patron, they go for more money than um, mm -hmm. if it's, you know, was owned by somebody nameless. So um, I can totally see parallels uh, there. Um, we're kind of getting a little bit close to time here, but I just wanted to um, make one more connection. I was really struck, William, by your last piece that you showed, Womb to Tomb, because it reminded me completely of um, one of my favorite objects of the Walters, um, a carved ivory from around the year um, 1100. And, um, sorry, 1200. Um, it's called the Vierge of France. So it's an opening virgin. So on the outside, it looks like a seated virgin and child. That's what it is. Um, but the sculpture itself splits open and inside are scenes from Christ's passion. So within Mary are all these scenes of the suffering of her son. So that made me absolutely think of um, what you have with that last piece there. I mean, I you might not make the same connection, but um, it's a uh, you. you know for me it was very medieval, so I I am grateful for you <laughs> making that piece, and I'm glad to hear Thank that you. it's right here in Washington. So I um, hope to I hope to see it someday. Thank, Thank you. So um, I wanted to thank both of our speakers. Um, this is an incredible program. I'm going to myself watch it again so I can make sure that I um, caught everything. And um, it's really, I'm really grateful that you um, really thought about the piece in our collection and um, show this current relevance today. So it's really wonderful. Um, so thank you both um, to Amnea Abdel Barr and William Rhodes for being with us here today. And a big thank you to our digital team behind the scenes who are producing this program. And an extra big thank you to um, you, the audience who are um, took some time to be with us this evening. Um, there's free access to the Walters Art Museum, both online and in person, we are a free museum. And this is made possible through the combined generosity of individual donors, foundations, corporations, and grants from the City of Baltimore, Maryland State Arts Council, citizens of Baltimore County, Howard County Government, and Howard County Arts Council. Um, we look forward to welcoming you back for more virtual programs um, and for upcoming programming. And by the way, you can also follow um, both um, Amnea and William on their 
various handles that are appearing about along the screen um, for upcoming programming, including artist talks, curatorial lectures, uh, performances, and more. Please visit our website at thewalters.org. And if you'd like to support the Walters, head to the link uh, Walters. Sorry, thewalters.org forward slash give. So finally, be safe, be well, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you all so much.